that Basia and we're not entirely sure whether to call this the Bas Yaakov Choir or the Kol Isha Choir. Um, the song that we just sang is from a 1931 songbook that I found in the Yivo archive. And I think it's appropriate for me to stop here and say um, what an amazing resource Yivo is. Um, I spent um, a year and various summers here. Um, I started my work on researching Beis Yaakov as a Dr. Emmanuel Pat research fellow here. Um, and the most, um, the richest hours of my intellectual life were spent a uh, few floors above us now. And I just would like to thank some of the people who helped me. I'm sure I'm going to forget many names. In the reading room, Ilya, who, who uh, Xeroxed the songbook for me, um, Ty, who photographed it when I couldn't read the Xerox, the rest of the staff there, Vital, Zyka, um, Alex Weiser, who helped put this event together, um, Alex Brandwine, who put the program together that you have in front of you, um, Ludmila Shavachova, who put together the exhibit. I hope you saw the exhibit of material out in the lobby. If you don't, if you didn't, you'll have a chance to look at it after the program. Um, Eddie Portnoy at Evo. Um, I hope I didn't forget anyone. But in any case, Evo is such a, a, a treasure for all of us throughout the world. I've um, come from a lot of different places to spend hours here. Um, the song that we just sung is the only one, as far as I know, that continues to be sung today. Um, but in the songbook that I found, and you see here a little bit of it, um, it's missing the chorus. And luckily, Danny Bernstein said, oh, I know that song, and here's the chorus. And we recorded it, and suddenly the song had a chorus. I don't entirely know why the songbook didn't include the, so the chorus, whether the chorus was written after the songbook was published in 1931. But in any case, it reminds me that there are some things that the archives know that the rest of us have forgotten. And there are some things that we know that the archives seem to have forgotten. So the question of what is the relationship between Beis Yaakov and the interwar period and the Beis Yaakov that we know today, I think is still not entirely settled. There is certainly a chain, you can say an unbroken chain that stretches from interwar Poland to our own world. And I'm just wondering how many Beis Yaakov girls there are out there in the audience. <laughs> Yay! How many on the stage? <laughs> and yet the fact that there is this apparently unbroken chain should not mislead us into thinking that the Beis Yaakov that we know today, the international network of loosely affiliated schools, 
is essentially the same as the movement that published the songbook in 1931. So what was Bass Yaakov and how did it begin? And some of the story is entirely familiar to many of you, I know. And those of you who know it, I hope you'll forgive, forgive my repeating it. As the story goes, in 1917, a dressmaker with an eighth grade education started a school in her apartment. As a response to the growing crisis in Krakow orthodoxy. Let me just say that what I just gave you is the kind of thumbnail that all Bess Yaakov girls acquire as part of their education. The story it turns out, and this is one of the things that the archives remember that maybe the movement doesn't, Sarah Schneer was not just your average seamstress with an eighth grade education. She was uh, not just an autodidact in Jewish sources, um, proof of what a girl can accomplish if she was motivated enough, but also extremely well um, educated in secular, she, in secular literature. She went to, she took classes and went to lectures in something called the Folk University, which was a kind of open university that was designed to educate the masses. Um, and in her Polish diary, which recently surfaced, you can read about her going to hear, for instance, a lecture on sexual hygiene. Um, she went to a conference on the German writer Herder in Vienna on her own because she was such a fan of her work. Um, and as a matter of fact, her, her Yiddish was not as good as her German or his, her Polish. And when she actually took on Yiddish, um, as a project in 1929, despite the fact that she wasn't fluent and stopped speaking Polish and German. So let me talk a little bit about the background of uh, what the world she came into and that in some sense she rescued for orthodoxy. So girls leaving the traditional world, um, secularizing, sometimes converting to Christianity, becoming socialists, secular Zionists, communists, even a few I think um, getting caught up in what's called the international white slave trade. Um, and the reason why I mention this is not for its titillating um, interest, and certainly not because it's part of official Bess Yaakov history, but because in which it would be entirely inappropriate to talk about these things, um, but because it explains a lot about how Bess Yaakov got international support in the interwar period. Um, Bess Yaakov basically rode a wave of international activism against the international white slave trade. And if you look in the archives at letters from the New York and the London and the Vienna office, you'll see that Bess Yaakov described itself as the Society for the Education and Protection of Jewish Girls in Eastern Europe. And the, the word protection is code for protection from pimps. Um, and despite the fact that they didn't use that language within the movement, outside of the movement, it made them appealing and attractive to various uh, feminists, suffragists even, fighting um, the sex traffic, including Eleanor Roosevelt, who uh, her a slogan by Eleanor Roosevelt is on the bottom of the letter of the, uh, the letterhead of the Vienna and the London offices. So in case you're wondering why Eleanor Roosevelt got a white base Yaakov, that's why. Um, Schneer's school, Sarah Schneer's school, saw immediate success, um, and soon she was sending her a little school that she had in her studio, she was sending her graduates, 13, 14, 15 years old, to nearby small towns to found branches of this school. Um, by 1923, um, there were seven such schools, and I'll remind everyone that in 1923, this was a time when Sarah Schneer was running Bess Yaakov entirely single-handedly, though she had some financial support from the Agoda in Krakow. Um, so in 1923, there were seven schools in Krakow and surrounding towns. Um, and that was the year of the, uh, the World Congress of the Agoda, um, in which the, delega the delegates voted to found a foundation for Torah study called Karen HaTorah. And this foundation took over the finances and administration of the system, and the uh, Beis Yaakov was truly launched. Um, it actually took a little bit more time than that for them to get involved in the day-to-day -day operations. And this particular chart that you see is actually much more complicated than it might seem. If you'll notice, between 1925 and 1926, 
the, the uh, explosive growth of the movement actually s slowed. Um, and one of the first things that happened once Aguda, in this case, um, the Karen Hatora, headed by uh, Dr. Leo Deutschlander, a, a Viennese Jew, um, one of the first things they did when they came to visit Sarashnera's little two-room studio where she was living with 25 girls, one of the first things they did is say, this has to stop. Um, so they actually stopped operations in 1925, uh, 1925, in February of 1925, and said, we have to do this more professionally. They moved the office from Krakow to Warsaw. Um, they put a bunch of more professional people than Sarah Schneer in charge. Um, and it took a minute or two for the program to, for the school system to uh, continue its growth. Here's a graph from 1931. I'm sorry. So these are the schools in Poland. This is a um, this map was drawn by a group of Viennese and German uh, Aguda administrators. Um, most of the Aguda that were closely involved with Beis Yaakov in the top rungs were German Jews. Um, they took a trip around uh, Poland to visit the Beis Yaakov schools and produce this map. I'll talk a little bit more about the map, but I'll just say that any, as people who investigate Beis Yaakov have figured out, any attempt to nail down the numbers of schools is always a little bit of an illusion for various reasons. The numbers tend to be misleading. Um, they're both too high and too low. Um, and the reason why, so one of the things about Beis Yaakov is that Beis Yaakov actually, people would, could open a Beis Yaakov, anyone who wanted could open a Beis Yaakov without contacting the central office, despite the fact that the central office continued to say, you can't just do that, you can't open it, you have to be in touch with us um, in every one of their newsletters. So the edges of the movement were a little bit blurry for that reason. Schools opened and closed. A lot of them were underground. They didn't have the proper permits. They were in, they were in uh, unhygienic buildings that were falling down, and the government wouldn't certify them. Sometimes it would just shut down because the parents would stop paying tuition. On the other hand, there were all kinds of other schools that were secretly Beis Yaakov schools, by which I mean there were schools in which um, it was well understood that the only solution to this epidemic of girls' defection from orthodoxy was to open up a Beis Yaakov school. But there were places in which Beis Yaakov was incredibly controversial. For instance, around the kind of Hungarian ultra-orthodox areas, especially in some place called Unterland. And there, um, the, for instance, that was where the Monkacha Rebbe called Beis Yaakov, Beis Esov, um, the house of Esau. But there were parents that really wanted to educate their girls, so they would open up a base, basically a base Yaakov that was staffed by a graduate of the seminary, but they wouldn't be called base Yaakov because base Yaakov wasn't kosher in that part of Eastern Europe. So th these are some of the complications with understanding these lists and why they're not completely accurate. But I think this map, and actually this is Poland, and you can already see it's a kind of ramified system in 1931, and it's begun to expand to beyond Poland, to uh, Austria. There's a, a seminary that opened in Vienna in 1930. In Czechoslovakia, there was another seminary that opened in Pressburg in 1935. It was a kind of a evening program. And then there was a full-fledged um, full teacher seminary in Czernowitz. Um, that also opened in 1935, also staffed by German-educated teachers that my mother went to. My mother's in the audience here, which I'm very pleased to say. Um, so the movement was clearly a uh, complicated and uh, ramified one. And let me try to explain what Beis Yaakov was in the interwar period. So Beis Yaakov was mostly these small town schools. Um, they tended to be, they were supplemental schools. They tended to be after school, sometimes they were before schools. So girls would be going to public schools, sometimes also to Catholic schools, but they'd be attending Beis Yaakov for a few afternoons, or sometimes every afternoon, and um, they'd also often be meeting as part of Benos groups um, on Shabbos and, the, and outside of school. Now speaking about outside of school, I think it's really important to understand that Beis Yaakov was not simply a school movement. 
So in the, uh, in the Shoah archives, in the oral histories of the Shoah Foundation, they ask a sort of script, where did you go to school, what did you learn? And the girls tend to say, or the girls, the survivors, now in their 80s and 90s, they tend to say, you know, we learned how to daven, and we learned a little ivra. Um, but when they're asked, sometimes when the interviewer goes off script and says, what else do you remember about Beis Yaakov? They say, well, the plays. The plays were Beis Yaakov plays, and I know those of you who went to Beis Yaakov, almost any time you went to Beis Yaakov, the plays were the big thing. Um, there were, uh, the, the, the Beis Yaakov amateur theater was often the most exciting thing in a small town, and it was so exciting, and Beis Yaakov was so well organized, I should have said that Beis Yaakov, along with its kind of male counterpart, Korev, um, the Aguda system's male schools, um, that was the largest stream of Jewish private um, educational system in Poland. So very often it was Beis Yaakov that was in a town and the secular parents would complain that their girls would beg them to go to Beis Yaakov just so they could be in a play. So, um, and these plays, as you can see, there's a lot I can say about the plays. And th then the secular parents would say, and look at what Beis Yaakov did. It turned my daughter into a little Rebetzin. Though they weren't just Rebbitsons, if you look at them, they're dressed as all <laughs> kinds of things, including rabbis. A few of the towns also had all-day high schools, and the first one we had was actually in Punavij, Lithuania. And let me see if anyone can guess why it was in Punavij. So the Panovich Rebbe, the Panovich Rav, I guess, is uh, lobbied to have a Beis Yaakov founded in his town. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that Beis Yaakov, in order to have women around, I mean, part of, part of the job of Beis Yaakov, one of the things that they said in the years when girls were leaving orthodoxy was, they don't want to marry from yeshiva boys. The Gary Rebbe complained he has 2,000 you know, old bachelors and he can't find wives for them. Um, and he, that was what he was complaining about in the you know, 1919, 1920. Already by 1923, 1924, he was crowing at the abundance of girls looking to marry from guys. This was what Beis Yaakov did. And the Russia yeshivas lobbied to have Beis Yaakov's founded in their schools, in their towns. And some, of the, um, and some of these yeshiva towns were places in which somehow boys and girls managed to find each other. Um, in the pizza store, I guess. Um, <laughs> no, not the pizza store. That's, I'm thinking of Borough Park. Um, so what else was Beis Yaakov? Beis Yaakov from the very first was also a vocational training program. So Sarah Schneer herself, when she founded her seminary, taught not only Limude Kodesh, is there a problem? No. So not, taught not only Limude Kodesh, she also taught dressmaking skills. And as we know, the 20s and especially the 30s in Poland um, were a time of great economic stress. And Beis Yaakov in part found an audience among families that were looking to help their daughters uh, make a living. Um, in the course of the 20s and 30s, these uh, vocational training centers became more and more elaborate. And um, in, 19, in the early 1930s, uh, uh, two major institutes of vocational training were founded, one in Lodge and one in Warsaw. Um, the one in Lodge was a postgraduate training center, so it was for girls who had completed Beis Yaakov, uh, 16, 17, 18, and um, they also had groups of girls training to, be, to, to make Aliyah, to go live in Palestine. They sent their first group, a kibbutz they called it, kibbutz Beis Yaakov. They sent their first kibbutz Beis Yaakov to Tel Aviv in 1934. Um, the Lodge uh, vocational training program had its, its height around um, 300 students at a time, and you can get a degree studying Jewish subjects in the morning and um, uh, vocational subjects in the afternoon. You can get a degree in nursing, social work, early childhood education, bookkeeping, secretarial work, etc. Um, in 1936, it was named Ohel Sarah after Sarah Schneer. 
but the proudest and most visible um, aspect of Beis Yaakov were its elite cadre of teachers, educated young women whose knowledge of Torah um, rivaled their brothers and even their fathers. And here I'm quoting from various visitors. Visitors would come through. This was kind of a tourist site. You'd bring Jacob Rosenheim would come visit from Frankfurt. They'd bring him to the colonies to see these girls studying morning till night. Um, these girls were dedicated pioneers, generally from middle class homes. The seminary wasn't cheap who lived in voluntary poverty in their zeal for the movement and its mission. And how did it go? What did it me mean to be a Beis Yaakov teacher? So it changed a little bit from the wild and woolly early days when Sarah Schneer was running it out of her own apartment to the seminary when it got a little bit more professional. But in the, especially in the early days and even in the later days, Sarah Schneer would travel to a small town um, where she had some connections Someone would rent a hall. She would take a student or two with her. In this rented hall, she would speak, and she would say to the Jewish mothers and fathers, how long can you sit and watch your daughter at the Shabbos table reading her romance novel or sneaking away Shabbos after the meal to hang out with her socialist friends? Um, I should say it with her rousing passion, but um, that's how she spoke. Um, after she spoke, the young girl from her apartment or from the seminary, once it was an eight-room eight apartment or from the seminary building, she would say, I happen to have a teacher right here with me. The teacher, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, would stand up and speak about the passion, the, the way Shabbos felt in the seminary. And Sarah Schneer would take the stage again and she said, if, if this town is ready, this girl is staying here. I need a family without young unmarried boys to take this girl in and to uh, put her up and this family will organize a Beis Yaakov committee and this girl, this teenage girl, would suddenly be the teacher, the fundraiser or the collector of tuition, the administrator, would sometimes have shifts of girls. Um, uh, my mother had 90 students in Beis, in Beis Yaakov of Torda. Um, from all ages, including from little kids to older than her. Um, and not only that, part of the job was also to continue to publicize the system in the small towns around whatever town that you happen to be in. We happen to know that from the statistics, one, uh, one teacher school had an average of around 100 students in five to seven grades. Um, and very often, we also know from the reports, the school committee, which was technically supposed to be in charge of collecting the tuition, um, which was what the girl was getting paid, did not always manage to do that. So the teacher was also expected to run the extracurricular activities, which meant including putting on a play. And when I, t when I talk about a play, I'm not just talking about a little school play. Often it was a, a movie theater was rented, posters were put, at, were put up around town, Arangang um, Nofafrayim. And they were also, the teacher was also expected to start a chapter of Benos, which was the Beis Yaakov Youth Movement, which in turn involved locating and funding a clubhouse and supplying it with a library. The teacher was often in charge of a school supply exchange, a clothing exchange, um, uh, finding visitor, visitor, visiting lecturers, and keeping in touch with the central offices. Just to give you an idea of how unwieldy this, uh, this movement was, there were four central offices. Um, not only that, students were expected to spend their summers in these professionalization programs. What you see here is a uh, um, in the five years, so Aguda took over Beis Yaakov in 1925, really, in February of 1925. They came in and said, we're taking over operations. Until 1925, the, the textbooks were handwritten. Basically, a lot of what the girls were doing in the seminary was sitting and taking notes of what Sarah Schneer was saying and then copying each other's notes. And these were the school textbooks. And when um, Dr. Deutschlander visited the seminary for the first time. Um, in his report, he says, 
If you saw this seminar, you would think the printing press had yet to be invented. So the first thing they did was to take away instruction from Sarah Schneer and import university trained young women from Frankfurt to run this professional, to teach in professionalization courses. Um, and students would be in these professionalization courses for three or four months and then they would graduate, there'd be an incredible ceremony, and then they'd be sent the next day off to their first assignment, not pass and go, by which I mean not stopping at home, because the central office was worried that if they stopped at home, the parents would get them involved in shidduchim, and social capital was, they were running on the labor energy of 18-year-old girls, and they couldn't afford to let that happen. So the rule was no going home after, your, after graduation. Um, so, t so these professionalization programs, which continued even when the seminary was up and running, the seminary building in 1931, connected teachers with each other, with young people, and with members of the youth movement, uh, Benos, who in turn ran a youth movement for younger girls called Basia. Um, and one of the things that I think I really want to stress is that when people think about Beis Yaakov, sometimes they think an in insular, uh, restrictive environment. For these girls, it was the opposite. They were coming from a culture in which Orthodox parents were so nervous about letting girls out of their sight that they instituted all kinds of rules for how to keep their daughters indoors, away from the theater, away from the streets. What Beis Yaakov did is it actually liberated girls from their Orthodox families, and it allowed them to travel on their own, to go for months and months at a time without any contact with their families, and instead building this kind of youth culture. So in my mind, there's no doubt that Beis Yaakov has to be thought of as a movement that gave girls freedom, as opposed to a movement that restricted them. Um, the crown jewel of the system was the Krakow Seminary. And as I said, it was one of four, but it was where um, Sarah Schneer was most active, and it was the center. It was in the town that was the birthplace of Beit Yaakov. The seminary was very selective, very rigorous. It was kind of, um, it was hard to get into, but it was also a place of religious passion and creative energy. The uh, Purim spiels in the uh, Beis Yaakov Seminary were famous. Vithna Kaplan, Basi Bender's uh, biography tells us that Vithna Kaplan played a goat in one of the Purim spiels. A goat who's watching the girls study Torah. I wish we had the script for that one. Um, so people noticed Beis Yaakov. They noticed the uh, 200 girls or 150 girls walking to the uh, grave of the Ramah on Rosh Chodesh, which was a ritual that Sarah Schneer inaugurated, arm in arm through the streets of Krakow. We know in other towns, um, for instance in Kalish, which was a, a fairly large city, um, the girls uh, davening, so the girls were, this is very unusual, girls in the Orthodox world today generally don't go to shul Friday evening. Um, after lighting candles on Friday evening, Beis Yaakovs would have a Kabbalat Shabbat service for the girls. Um, in the uh, Kalish Beis Yaakov, this Beis Yaakov had apparently such a great choir that tourists would come and stand outside the building on Friday afternoon to hear the girls singing. This, as I said, one of the reasons the Munkacher Rebbe was not happy about Beis Yaakov was because despite um, the fact that these girls were singing in technically sexually segregated arenas, their voices traveled. These were large groups of girls, and they liked to sing loud. Um, so what united all the branches of this movement, oh, there's the Ramah Synagogue, uh, which was the site of uh, one of Sarah Schneer's pilgrimage uh, rituals. Um, every Rosh Chodesh, she would take the girls to daven at the grave of the Ramah. Um, and she, she, once they invented many other rituals, revived them. Um, the Beis Yaakov, you know, is that coming up? Oops. So this is the Beis Yaakov, you know, the longest running uh, Yiddish journal directed at uh, Jewish women in the interwar period. It ran from 1923 to 1939. 
and it was um, uh, Eliezer uh, uh, Laser Gershon Friedenson was the editor, actually founded it, went to Sarshnerer and said, how can I serve you? How can I help you? Before the Aguda, the World Congress in which the Aguda officially founded Karen Atoro, which adopted Beis Yaakov, he approached Sarshnerer. And the story he tells about why he approached Sarshnerer is that he was an, a young Poale Aguda, Aguda Sisrael activist who would go from town to town to town uh, giving talks. And he said, whatever anyone threw at him, he had a good answer to. Until someone said to him, it's all good and well, the Aguda, but you're here, and you're, you, the Yeshiva Bacharim are here. Where are your girls? You want to know where your girls are? The Orthodox girls are with us. They're in the socialist clubs, and the Zionist clubs, and the communist clubs. And Friedenson was so shaken by this that when he heard about Sarsner's enterprise, he made his way to this little two-room seminary, and he said, what can I do for you? And she said, let me uh, please start a journal to publicize this movement, and he did. The Siakov Journal, 139 issues, um, some of them with as many as 100 pages. It's a resource that I think the movement today um, uh, could draw a lot from. So what was in the Beis Yaakov Journal? Beis Yaakov Journal um, had, for instance, it reported news of the movement. So it had a column which said, you know, what's happening in Beis Yaakov of Kalish? What's happening in Beis Yaakov of Sadagora? Internationally. Um, it also had an advice column from Schwester to, to Schwester. It had book reviews. It had a few reader surveys. It had essays of general interest to its members and much more. The other thing it did is it, it, um, it published orthodox literature. There were very few uh, venues for the publication of orthodox literature, published orthodox literature by men and by women. And my father, and there was a Polish supplement for the first few years until 1929 when the movement became officially Yiddishist, Orthodox Yiddishist. Um, and uh, my father published a poem at the age of 14 in the Polish uh, supplement. So for, my father was a Hasidic young man. Where would a Hasidic young man publish a poem in Polish? The Beis Yaakov Journal. The Beis Yaakov Journal also really tried to reach out to women and tried to encourage women to publish literature. And it included any, uh, it, so it published it rediscovered all the orthodox literature in history, including it, it, uh, it ran a very long series of Glickel of Hamlin's memoirs. Uh, it had a, a column about the Tzenarena. And in case you're thinking, well, of course these women knew about the Tzenarena. Not necessarily. Some of them were already citified, um, sophisticated young women. And learning about the Tzenarena was something they had to do from a newspaper. Um, it also discovered and praised uh, some of the older Yiddish women poets. And this takes us to our second song by Miriam Olenover, who was herself uh, not Beis Yaakov school age, but was a little bit older. And um, uh, she was the orthodox poet that the Beis Yaakov Journal really uh, enjoyed um, not only publishing in the journal, but they also set some of her poetry to music. And that's the next song. It's called uh, Antikolach. <laughs> I'm not a 
Grace Yaakov, I hope it's clear, was not just a movement to educate Orthodox girls. Grace Yaakov was a framework in which to live, a framework that continued way past graduation and when school was not in session. Its youth movement, um, Benos Agudas Yisrael, was intended for graduates of the, of the afternoon schools, many of them working girls. It was founded by the incredibly energetic uh, Gershon Friedenson, who's also the editor of the Besiako Journal, who was also the editor-in-chief of the Besiako Publishing House, um, and who was also one of the founders of Poale Agudas Yisrael, which was you want to say that Aguda had a kind of right wing and a left wing, the Poale Aguda Sisral was kind of the socialist tinged left wing of the Aguda. Um, and Benosa Aguda Sisral was also in some ways uh, had the same kind of socialist tinge. At its meanings, it was considered self governing. And its meanings, no one over the age of 18 was permitted to speak. Um, and the girls who lived together in what they called kibbutzim. And we know that, for instance, the DP camps had kibbutz benos, Agudas Yisrael, a few of them did. Um, they believed in pooling their resources, clothing exchange. Um, they ran free libraries and lecture series. Um, the uh, benos, as I said, also ran a youth movement for younger girls that was called Basia which I believe is my cue for introducing the band. So I'll just say a couple of important things that you need to know about them. Basia Schechter, Grace Yaakov of Bar Park. <laughs> Malky Miller, Grace Yaakov of Montreal and Grace Yaakov of Toronto. <laughs> Danny Bernstein. Beis Yaakov of Borough Park and Beis Yaakov High School of Borough Park. <laughs> Rifki, Beis Yaakov of Borough Park. And then we have um, <laughs> Batya Okunov. I don't know what she's doing here. Beis Rifka. <laughs> Shai Wetzer. Uh, Shai Wetzer is on percussion. And John Schott is on guitar. Basia <laughs> Schechter. And what our name is, we're not entirely clear. It's either the Beis Yaakov Choir or the Kolisho Choir. Oh, Roni. Roni Mazel. <laughs> Kelech. Kelech in Jerusalem. Um, and since we have some Basias here, let's sing the next song.
I forgot this slide for Benos, so I'm giving you a quick look at it, so quick. De Siaco reached into the lives of the youngest children attempted, attempting to cement their ties to Yiddishkeit early, but it also forged new connections among adult Jewish women in school committees, and more impressively, in the Neshe Aguda Yisrael, the women's branch of the World Aguda, which brought together the Yaakov teachers, the wives of distinguished Orthodox leaders, and um, the wives of Hasidic leaders like the Gera Rebetzin, and activists and fundraisers, um, some of them not even Orthodox, throughout Europe and beyond. Um, this culture then was intended to uh, embrace Jewish girls and women throughout their whole lives, in some sense, uh, reforging connections in a way that the traditional Jewish family had been failing to do. For many of the girls and young women, especially in the seminaries, Beis Yaakov was, to quote the Devorah Weissman, who wrote an important early work on this, um, it was a total institution with a rich program of activities um, slogans, mottos, symbols, special holidays and celebrations, literature, songs, leadership roles, and new forms of organization. It was in this context that that song that we just sang, um, as simple as it seems, should be understood in the full force of its pioneering characteristic um, as a revolution in the name of tradition. This phrase, which is the subtitle of my book, um, is a complicated one. What does it mean to talk about the connection between the new and the old in this way? And Alt Nai is a, appears in the, base, in the Benos hymn, which we'll sing in a little bit. Um, and what did it mean for Beis Yaakov to be both a kind of new way of organizing women and also to be grounded in tradition itself in the deepest possible way? Um, and I'll remind people that this is a tradition that did not have a lot of resources, um, first of all, to even encourage, if not to actually, to allow, much less encourage, girls' Torah study, or female initiative, or youth, or passion, or even religious devotion by young girls. And to get our mind around this, I think you could just look at the very name Beis Yaakov, um, which illustrates the way that the movement attempted to ground its novelties within a traditional framework. It found praise for girls' Torah study within a religious system that more clearly condemned it. The name Beis Yaakov, as I'm sure many of you know, was taken from the verse at the beginning of the story of the giving of the Torah on Sinai, when God says, Ko tamar levet Yaakov, Israel. By the way, not the accent that I said that in Beis Yaakov. Um, and Rashi says, Beit Yaakov, Elu Hanashim. These are the women. And women, I'll point out, are mentioned first before B'nai Israel, the men. Um, this midrash is not just a textual validation for women's Torah study in the face of opposition that continued throughout the interwar period. Beis Yaakov also took this verse as a warrant to create a new set of rituals around the date on which God spoke these words, in, its, in some way insisting that Beis Yaakov had been there at Sinai. And during the interwar period, um, Sarishner instituted a Beis Yaakov holiday that was on Gimel Sivan, three days before the giving of the Torah when Kotamar was said. And this holiday was marked in the seminary by celebratory speeches and girls singing and dancing for hours around Sarishnir. They sang Kotam Arlevet Yaakov, though I don't know which tune they had. Um, and these are songs that continue to be sung in the movement today. And I think we need to uh, try to recapture all the tunes by which these songs were sung in our archival work. Um, so Beis Yaakov had a flair for both sides of this equation, the revolutionary and the traditional. Um, this, uh, so I would also place the song that we're about to sing now in the category of its talent for taking old things and making them new. 
So we're about to sing a, a fairly well-known traditional Yiddish song that was recorded by Adrian Cooper, among others. And the only reason I know that Beis Yaakov changed the words to this song is because Michael Rex, uh, in a very crowded and very noisy bar in Toronto, told me so. And then he sang me the variation on the song that he said his mother learned in Beis Yaakov of Warsaw. So we're going to sing the traditional song, um, which has a chorus, Ach vi voil, ach vi git, sis zu sein, zu sein ayid, um, with the, what I call the, it could be called the Wex variation, or I call the Beis Yaakov of Warsaw variation, Ach vi fein and Ach vi edel, sis zu sein ayidish meidel, or idol, meidel.
traditional songs and other traditional practices could only go so far in establishing Beis Yaakov, which was compelled to construct the culture almost without precedent. Beis Yaakov presented itself as a faithful continuation of the Jewish tradition in the spirit of Torah, the traditional Jewish family, and the exalted roles of women as mothers and wives. But what could be called the delivery system of these traditional values had to be constructed from scratch, given that the old channels between mother and daughter had been so damaged by the forces of modernity. So where did Beis Yaakov find the resources, the various components of what was essentially a new culture? In my book, I detail nine different places, but here I would like to just discuss two in the time we have left. Um, and the first of these was um, German neo-Orthodoxy. German-speaking Jews, under the influence of, Sa of uh, Samson or Hirsch, had long paved the way for an orthodoxy that could speak to women with its educational systems and youth movements in which young orthodox women were full participants. These women included, and you see in this picture, a picture of Judith Rosenbaum, these were the women that were sent east to staff the teacher training programs of Beis Yaakov once Deutschlander had, uh, had professional, began to professionalize the system. But Samson and Fall Hirsch's thought was also a, a very important part of the seminary culture. Girls were actually required to own a copy of the 19 letters before they were admitted to the seminary. Instruction in many classes in the seminary was in German, since so many of the teachers were German speakers. And the novels of Marcus Lehman that you see here were imported uh, from Germany to Poland and translated into Yiddish to fill the shelves of Benos and Beis Yaakov libraries and the pages of Beis Yaakov journals. These were novels that Orthodox women directed, the Orthodox writers directed to women, and this was a crucial gap in Poland, where young Orthodox girls had only secular Polish novels to read. But in many other regards, German Orthodoxy set the tone for Beis Yaakov. Beis Yaakov was, in some sense, Report, the very idea of a report card of a class that had a beginning and an end, that they didn't just read Gemara all day long, a textbook, even a subject called Judaism, um, these were perfect to create an orthodox culture for girls who were neglected in the educational systems of uh, the earlier traditional culture. And the German influence on the culture might also explain the very um, pronunciation of the name Beis Yaakov, the fact that Beis Yaakov was pronounced by girls in what I would call a gendered academic idiolect pronunciation, which is that Hebrew was taught in Beis Yaakov, but not in boys' yeshivas for the most part, as a language with a grammar, and it was taught correctly, I put that in quotes, and what developed was a form of Hebrew, which could be called Beis Yaakov Ivris, um, so that girls essentially spoke Hebrew with a different accent than their brothers. Um, and how and why did this develop? Partly because what girls did was in some ways beneath the scrutiny of the rabbis who policed boys' education. As long as girls didn't study Torah Shabbat Peh, the oral law, what they did, um, first of all, there were no long established patterns to say what they did, but what they did as long as they kept away from studying Gemara, was okay. So German neo-orthodoxy was allowed to spread into Poland and to Eastern Europe, um, as long as it stopped exactly at the Mechitza line. Um, what this meant is that what was on one level a denominational um, difference between Eastern European ultra-orthodoxy and German neo-orthodoxy or modern orthodoxy or a geographical distinction between Central Europe and Eastern Europe became, oddly, in Poland, a gender distinction. Um, and what this meant is that girls were, in some sense, more modern, received a more professional and worldly education than boys, um, by virtue of what Iris Karush calls the benefits of marginality. Um, and even the complaints of the Munkach Rebbe, that Beis Yaakov was bisisive, um, the main reason he complained was not because he was so against what the girls were doing within the walls of their school, 
but by virtue of the fact that what they were doing within the walls of their school could be heard in the base medrash next door. Um, in some ways, Beis Yaakov girls were more modern, more German in some sense than their brothers, though this is only true in a limited sense because what was going on in Beis Yaakov was also at least as passionate um, a connection with Torah and traditional Judaism, which gets me to the next of the influences, which is Hasidism. Um, the school was often described as being Hasidic, as if it had a Hasidic feel, as if it was natural that it was Hasidic, because so many of the girls came from Hasidic homes. But in fact, and I know that this is still a debate among scholars of Hasidism, coming from a Hasidic home did not necessarily give you any kind of Hasidic experience. You weren't welcome um, in the Hasidic court. You didn't get any kind of Hasidic education. Um, it, it didn't say very much about your being a Hasidic, a, a, a Hasid. Um, Beis Yaakov was Hasidic in a new sense, uh, completely outside of any kind of affiliations with a particular Hasidic group, even though Ger Hasidim, as important within Aguda, did play a big part demographically in Beis Yaakov. But Beis Yaakov was pan-Hasidic. It included many different Hasidic groups under its auspices. Um, it was also pan-Hasidic in the sense that it harkened back to a kind of imagined earlier ecstatic devotional period associated with um, an interest in nature um, and a, a, a romantic attachment to uh, ecstatic experiences um, that were not available in the classroom. Beis Yaakov was an important part of Beis Yaakov um, experience to travel. And I think this came from Sarah Schneer, but Sarah Schneer was envious as much about the travel that Hasidim did as she was about their arrival in the Hasidic court. Um, Sarah Schneer lamented in her uh, autobiography the exclusion of girls from Hasidic experience. So Beis Yaakov borrowed Hasidic practices and made them available to girls, but not by bringing the men back home to the Shabbos table or the, or the table around uh, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur when a Hasid would be at the court. It did it by recreating the experiences that men had for girls, especially in the seminaries, where girls lived together, learned together, sang together, and also, although this wasn't said very openly in the movement, venerated Sarah Schneer as a kind of Hasidic Rebbe, as the secular press was perfectly happy to say. Um, in the case of, and, and uh, among the more interesting um, rituals that Sarah Schneer invented were uh, ritual, were pilgrimage rituals. I already described the pilgrimage ritual of the, uh, the, the Rosh Chodesh ritual when the girls were in town to the cemetery uh, of the Ramah, where the Ramah is buried, she also instituted a kind of pilgrimage ritual that has more parallels, I think, with socialist youth culture, which is a kind of night hike that would um, begin at midnight at the bottom of a mountain. It would continue till halfway up a mountain at a clearing, a, a fire would be lit, and the girls would sing and dance around Sarah Schneer, typically. The girls were hiking in the pitch black, holding hands with Sarah Schneer at the, at the head. Um, and I guess it's good that she was setting the pace. And, um, and they would arrive at the mountaintop at daybreak. Um, I'll say one more sentence, and then uh, we'll move to our next song. So we're um, borrowing from German models constituted a geographical or denominational shift from west to east, from more modern to stricter orthodoxy. In the case of the Hasidic world, and also the yeshiva world, Beis Yaakov rather performed a gender shift, taking religious and educational practices, ideals, and structures that had previously organized the lives of boys and men, and retooling them for girls and women. Um, in the case of going to visit the graves, um, I think Sarah Schneer might have liked to take groups of Beis Yaakov girls to visit the courts of living Hasidic, Hasidic rebbe's. Um, I don't think she would be welcome. Um, dead rebbe's had the advantage of, 
Let's just say they could hardly protest. Um, in this way, visiting the graves of dead Rebbe's became an important part of what Beis Yaakov borrowed from Hasidic culture. Um, I don't know that the next song we're going to sing was actually sung at um, a Shacharist ritual, but it strikes me that it might have been, and if you hear, if you read the words, you see why I think so. And it was written by Eliezer Schindler, who wrote the lyrics of the Beis Yaakov and the Bas Yehim. He was an important poet in the uh, Beis Yaakov movement. So we're going to commune with nature a little bit and imagine ourselves at the top of this mountain and hear the birds. And we're not just gonna hear the birds. Like true chassas, we're gonna be the birds. So let's all find our inner bird. <laughs> Yaakov, which suffered a devastating blow along with the rest of Jewish Poland, had already become an international movement in the 1930s, opening branches in the land of Israel and in the United States. Um, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I forgot. I have to introduce the next song. So um, this is the Benos hymn. Um, I, I, was, I, I think it's running late, so I'm not going to talk about what Beis Yaakov borrowed from socialism. Read my book, available in the lobby outside. Um, in the case of its borrowing from youth movements, I would just say very, very quickly that the, uh, where the borrowing from German neo-orthodoxy was a kind of geographical denominational shift, the borrowing from Hasidism uh, was a kind of gender shift, in the borrowing from youth movements, you could call it a desecularization. They took ideas of, that were popular, socialist ideas, for instance, and discovered their roots within the tradition. And the revival of Tuba Av, which was a very important Beis Yaakov uh, holiday, um, I think had some of this, on the one that Serzhner did it, not emphasize the romantic aspects of the uh, of this day. The girls were anyway in their camp, in their summer camps and professionalization courses. There were no boys around. There was no Shadukham happening that day. She emphasized that girls wore borrowed dresses. And Benos already had a, a clothing exchange, already had the value that if you owned a nice dress, it was in principle available to all your Benos sisters, as the Benos, and the very term sister 
itself is taken from those kind of uh, movements, those kind of uh, youth movements in which everybody's a sister or a brother. So um, I want to, I want to, I, I, if, I hope I've been talking long enough about this idea of an old new culture that when we sing the Benosin, you see the old and you see the new. So that's our next song. anthems that appeared in the archives because in 1929 the Beis Yaakov announced a 
competition for the Benos anthem. This is the one that won, but we also have one of the not winning uh, anthems. Do you think I picked the right one? The Siako suffered a devastating blow along with the rest of Jewish Poland um, with the Holocaust, but it had already become an international movement in the 1930s, opening branches in the land of Israel and the United States. Um, in many ways, I think those of you who know Beis Yaakov today will agree that it's a more conservative movement. But some of the spirit of the early years lives on. Um, and there is a culture of commemoration and pilgrimage. And the way this project started for me was by bumping into a group of Beis Yaakov girls in the courtyard of the Ramos Synagogue in Poland, Krakow, at the Jewish Culture Festival. And um, it led to uh, a renewed interest in a part of my uh, background that I didn't think I, that I thought I knew perfectly well, and that became clear I barely knew at all. Um, so despite this culture of commemoration, I think there are many more things to be learned about Beis Yaakov. Um, and as I said, it wasn't until, for instance, it wasn't until I was well along the way in my research that I discovered that the same courtyard in which I had bumped into those Beis Yaakov girls was the site of a monthly pilgrimage that Sarah Schneer instituted. Um, so this religious pilgrimage that those girls were on and the women of Moshe Agudas Yisrael that, that erected the grave of Sarah Schneer, I think is part of a much um, larger project than maybe they knew. And um, it also uh, occurs to me that the, the the group of people, the diverse range of people involved in Beis Yaakov in those early years might be wider than you assumed. I already described Beis Yaakov as affiliated in some regard with the left wing of the Agudas Yisrael. Beis Yaakov also had a lot of interesting rebels in its mix. So the, the Shmuel Nadler, who won the contest for, to write the Benos hymn that you just heard, um, which he wrote at the age of um, 20 or maybe 19, um, what is, is an interesting character. Maybe I'll just say a little bit more about him. Um, here he is. He was the one figure that emerged out of this period of Beis Yaakov, a good uh, literary activity that was a kind of crossover hit. He was admired not only within Orthodox circles, but also within the general um, uh, literary establishment in Warsaw. And he, somebody, he got into a big fight with Aguda. If we had more time, I would tell you all the details. Read about it on, on our um, uh, website. Um, and he, uh, at one point, he was about to give a talk at the Warsaw Pen Club in, in January of 1934. And he appeared in the club. Um, the club was unusually filled. He was a Ger Hasid, and it was filled with Ger Hasidim because he was a big star. He was all of, what was he then? He was in his 20s. Um, and so it was Ger Hasidim, and it was the usual literary crowd, and um, a big uh, gasp overtook the crowd when he showed up, and um, he had taken off his yarmulke, and he had cut off his payas, and he announced that the Aguda was not fit to be leading uh, youth, and that he was becoming a communist. Um, and he did this in public. Uh, another woman that I discovered, uh, a Beis Yaakov teacher, a very, very popular Beis Yaakov teacher, not only among the girls of Parasov, it's in the Yizkar Buch of Sefer Parasov, but also about the boys of Parasov, of the boys of Parasov, who she was bringing them back to orthodoxy. She was making Bale Tshuva, and she also founded a library, which is something Beis Yaakov teachers were supposed to do. And unfortunately, the books got sent to the wrong address, and it was discovered that she had ordered her books from a communist publishing company. So Beis Yaakov, what the, whether this means she was a secret agent or both a Beis Yaakov teacher and a communist, I don't think we know. But let's just say that the tent that was Beis Yaakov, uh, the umbrella that it was, um, despite its clear um, intentions, covered over a more interesting and diverse group of people than you might imagine. And that among them were people who were graduates who not only fulfilled the dreams of its founder, but also those who took different paths, but were nevertheless shaped by these dreams. And here's a picture of one of those places where at least some of the people on this stage were shaped. 
And before we go into our final song, so I'd like to introduce Danny. So the Basiakov Project, let me just say, is now growing. And what it is so far is whatever we are, um, uh, with Basia Schefter's amazing arrangement of these songs, and we intend to keep looking for more things to revive about this culture. It's also a website which Danny Bernstein has been running and which she'll introduce to us in a minute. And it's also a documentary film project. Pearl, can you stand up? Run by Pearl Gluck. <laughs> Danny? I'm just going to do a quick run through of the website just so that you can see what we're, what we're doing here. Um, so this, this website has two main purposes and two main audiences for those purposes. Okay. So I'll just tell you a little bit about it before, while that's happening. The two main purposes and audiences that we have for this, there's the academic audience and there's pretty much everyone else who's interested in it. Um, so one of the things that got this started was, as Nomi was saying, it's, it, uh, all these archives where all of this material is, they're spread out all over the place in various archives that are organized around other topics. There's no central place to look at Basiakov. Um, artifacts. Thank you. Um, so that's one thing that we're doing here is just making this available to researchers. Kind of something that we wish that we had when we were doing our own research. Um, so now it's available to others. Um, and the other purpose is just for anyone who's interested in it. Um, a lot of what we know about Basiakov growing up in Basiakov, as Nomi said, is kind of an oral history. It's kind of passed down, right? We hear these stories. I've heard stories of my own grandmother who attended Basiakov for just a short amount of time, whose notebooks were ripped up by the Rebetzin who called Basiakov Baisaisev. Um, so she only went there for a short amount of time. She called it Baisaisev, the base ace of the, the, that saying that it's, it's a terrible place. Basiakov is a terrible movement. So I'm just going to take you through a little bit, just going through some of the pages of this website. Um, you'll see on our front page, you can get to everything. You can also get to everything through the menu up on top. We have a little bit about Basiakov, just a short blurb about Basiakov and who we are, what we're doing, why we're doing it. Um, that's us here. We then have a timeline. So this is a timeline of Basiakov, and if you scroll through it, you'll see some of the major dates. Um, this is a ton of work on Nomi's part, um, going through this and organizing everything and uh, getting it into a, a, telling the story. Some of the more interesting stuff, uh, not more interesting, but when you can start getting deep, digging deeper into things, we have people. So we're organizing this based around the figures of Basiakov, some of the people who were um, associated with Basiakov. So obviously we have Sarah Schneer here. Um, Devorah Applegrad Cohn is someone who, whose material we have gotten. Someone was, uh, Naftali Cohn was kind enough to donate and let us use those on our website. So we're able to have a little biography about someone who went to Basiakov and who taught in Basiakov. If you, if you go into each of these, I'm not going to go into each of them now, but if you go into each of them, there's some information about them, um, links to some of the other documents that um, are about them or that connect to them in some way. We have places. Um, some of the, this one over here is just a walking tour of Krakow, so kind of echoing that pilgrimage um, sense where you can actually look through this and you can, if you're in Krakow, you can follow this and you can go to all the places of significance to um, the, the Basiakov movement. Each of these is drawn, these pins on these maps are drawn from documents that list um, the schools that when they're founded, who the teacher was, how many students were in them. And if you click through each of these, you can see all that information 
laid out on a map so you can really get the full effect of what that looked like geographically. And then just a few of these other things. Here are some photos. Each of these, again, you click on each of these, you can get a wealth of information about each one. We don't always know who is in each picture, but as much information as we have about each picture, we put that in. We also have documents. Same thing, click on each one and you can get some information. There's the Basiakov journal um, with a little bit about what's in each one. Now one of the next stages of the project is going to be to translate these because they're all in Yiddish and Polish. Um, so, but we're gonna get more people on board hopefully and go through that. And then a really fascinating one, Basiakov in the news. So Basiakov wasn't just spoken about by people in Basiakov, it was all over the place also. There was, there was news about it in the religious and secular um, press. So if you go through here, these are mostly drawn from J Press, which digitizes historical Jewish newspapers. And there are some from other places as well, like the Forvix. Um, and each of these, you can really get a sense of what people are saying about Beis Yaakov. Finally, bringing everything together is our blog. As of now, we have a couple of posts on here, and we're planning to uh, post something once a week or month, once a month, depending on um, how we work that out. There are things like the world of Sarah which is a translation of an article. Um, this first installment is right is after her death, detailing um, the last few months of her life. Um, this one here, the 93 Martyrs, Basiakov in the Fight Against Traffic in Women, is as Nomi mentioned before, that quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, um, saying that Basiakov is a good thing and asking, well, why is she saying that? So this post goes into detail on how that's connected and makes the connection between the well-publicized story about the 93 Basiakov girls who chose suicide rather than risk being forced into prostitution. And then there's this one over here, which tracks the Basiakov plays and brings it, makes a little bit of a connection to what goes on now and the Basiakov plays that are in contemporary Basiakovs. So I hope that you take a look through the website and um, if you have any documents or photos that you would like to donate to us, we can scan them and give them back to you. Um, and if you want to help with transcribing or anything, there's a contact form here and you can let us know. Thank you. So um, because this is a concert as well as a book talk, we figured we would skip the Q&A and if people want to keep talking, um, after we do our last song, I'll be sitting out in the lobby and signing books if you want to buy a book or just talking if you want to talk. Um, and we wanted to end um, with the Basiakov lead again. Thank you.
Thank you.